Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. So those patients relapsing off of brutinib who have CLL thus far have generally been patients with high risk disease, 17 petaliter or complex cytogenetics. It's been noted that approximately half of them are relapsing with Richter's transformation, while half relapse with progressive CLL. The first six patients who relapsed with progressive CLL were studied with sequencing studies. And interestingly, five out of six were found to have a mutation in the cysteine in BTK to which abrutinib binds covalently. In addition, one of them, as well as the sixth patient, also carried an activating mutation in the immediate downstream target of BTK, PLC gamma 2. These findings strongly suggested that, in fact, targeting BTK is the primary mechanism by which abrutinib carries out its functions. This had been somewhat in question because abrutinib does target a variety of other kinases in addition to BTK, but the emergence of that resistance mutation strongly suggests that the effect on BTK is critical in disease response. Since then, there have been four additional patients reported who relapsed with CLL who did not have BTK mutations, although one of them had a PLC gamma 2 mutation. We wait larger studies to determine the exact incidence of the BTK and PLC gamma 2 mutations in the CLL relapsers. To date, there have not been any biologic studies of the Richter's transformation because this is often hard to obtain tissue and often treatment needs to be initiated emergently. But multinational collaborations of investigators are now trying to get adequate tissue to better understand what mutational profile may underlie the development of Richter's in these patients. Finally, we hope that such studies will enable us to better choose salvage therapy after abrutinib, because at present, outcomes are poor, and the optimal salvage therapy is really entirely unknown. To date, combination data with abrutinib is still relatively limited. A combination study with rituximab has been reported from the MD Anderson. In this study, it appeared that patients did extremely well with high response rates, but the progression-free survival was not terribly different from what we would expect with single-agent abrutinib. Interestingly, there are in vitro data suggesting that abrutinib inhibits the ADCC activity, which might inhibit the activity of rituximab in vivo. That being said, in the studies to date, there's not obvious antagonism, but there's also not clearly much benefit from the addition of rituximab to abrutinib. Randomized trials are ongoing to assess whether abrutinib-rituximab is better in terms of progression-free survival than abrutinib alone. The newer anti-CD20 antibody, obinutuzumab, which has a different mechanism of action, including direct cytotoxicity, as well as enhanced ADCC, has also been studied in vitro in combination with abrutinib. And there, the inhibitory effects of abrutinib were less than those that were seen with rituximab. So currently, a lot of interest is focusing on combinations with abinutuzumab, which is also generally a more potent antibody in CLL than rituximab. Abrutinib is generally given continuously until progression in patients who initiate therapy with abrutinib. It has not been used for consolidation or maintenance following other types of therapies in clinical trials as yet. Most patients start it with active disease. Another targeted agent that I'm very excited about is venetoclax, or ABT199. Venetoclax works by binding to BCL2 and inducing apoptosis in the CLL cells. One of the things that differentiates venetoclax from ibrutinib and idelizumab is the rapidity and the depth of the responses that we see. So ibrutinib and idelizumab induce a lymphocytosis, and patients will initially have either stable disease or a partial response with lymphocytosis, and will evolve slowly over time into achieving a partial response, and then into even potentially having a complete response which we do see, but often after periods of two to three years. Venetoclax actually induces responses very quickly, with patients responding 
almost immediately and with very deep responses with MRD negativity being, a, being achieved very early on. The issue, of course, with venetoclax is going to be tumor lysis syndrome, which is something that is very concerning and worrisome and has been associated with two deaths in early studies. One of the things that I think will be very important going forward in thinking about how to use these agents, it's really the idea to use the venetoclax in patients who have had really a large amount of tumor debulking already. CLL patients for so long have been treated with the watch and wait strategy that when we go to treat CLL patients, they have huge tumor burdens. And it really is sort of the perfect setup for having a tumor lysis syndrome with the use of venetoclax. So I think a change in the treatment strategy, either treating patients ahead of time with obinutuzumab or idelisib or ibrutinib, in essence giving them maybe six to nine months of therapy, allowing the disease burden to be remarkably lessened by these agents, and then using venetoclax at that time to sort of kill off the residual disease will really enable us to achieve very deep remissions and hopefully be able to you know, get our patients off therapy long term rather quickly. In following the success of ibrutinib in treating CLL and a lot of other indolent lymphomas, there's been a group of second generation inhibitors of Bruton's tyrosine kinase. These agents tend to be far more specific and still bind to the exact same amino acid residue in BTK that ibrutinib does. So all these agents bind to the cysteine at 481, and that enables it to irreversibly inhibit Bruton's tyrosine kinase. At levels achieved clinically, ibrutinib probably inhibits nine different enzymes. And these nine different enzymes are probably responsible for the toxicities and not for the therapeutic benefit of, of ibrutinib. With these second generation BTK inhibitors, namely ACP196 and ONO4059, we're now achieving equal efficacy because they all bind to the same amino acid residue, but now only inhibit perhaps three enzymes at physiological levels, and therefore we're not having the toxicities associated with ibrutinib, namely the bleeding and the diarrhea. So these agents are something that we're looking forward to that may actually help improve the tolerability of what already is a very well-tolerated therapy.